but well, let's just go ahead and open uh, with prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that we have the opportunity to come together and uh, seeking your face, enjoying your presence and hearing your word, Lord God. We know that you do great and wonderful things in us when we give you the opportunity, yes. when we set ourselves aside to soak up, Lord God, what you want to communicate, Lord. So we're just sponges here before you tonight, Lord God, to hear your word, to receive, and, and to grow in our faith, Lord. So that we can put the things that we hear into action, Lord, with the end result being, Lord, the, the glory of your name in this earth and throughout all eternity. So we thank you for this, this time that sometimes may seem insignificant, Father God, but it is a time of significance because we're hearing your word. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, we've been uh, focusing in this class, you know, on, on some of the doctrinal uh, teachings of the Bible, not necessarily the basic doctrinal teachings of the Bible. We're trying to go a little bit beyond uh, that, a little bit, you know, as far as, as far as the Lord allows and as far as we can handle, <laughs> um, you know, regarding some of these different things. And we talked about, you know, the Bible and how we've got it, and we talked about inspiration and the moving of the Holy Spirit. We talked about Christology, which is the study of Christ, and we talked about the fathership of God in our last segment. So we're going to kind of round off the Trinity by talking about the Holy Spirit um, in this in this session. And we're looking at it from a couple of different points of view. One, we're going to be talking about who is the Holy Spirit. That's tonight. We're going to be talking about what the Holy Spirit does uh, in the earth and in particular in our lives because he, he, he does really more in the earth than uh, our lives individually and particularly. He's involved in the whole show. Uh, and that's going to that's take a while. We're going to talk about what he does in us to facilitate working through us. Okay, so the Holy Spirit gifting us, enabling us, anointing us, if you will, to be able to be an extension uh, of God here in the earth. So it's who the Spirit is, what He's doing in us, and what He wants to do through us. And so that'll be kind of the, the outline uh, of what we're doing. And there's, there's a lot involved <laughs> in that, as you, as you can imagine. Um, we're Pentecostals, you know. We're supposed to know uh, a lot about the Holy Spirit. You know, we're, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, after all, and we speak in tongues and... We believe in the gifts of the Spirit and all of these things. But one of the things that I've discovered um, being a Pentecostal is that we tend to pigeonhole the Holy Spirit. Okay, We tend to want particular manifestations of the Holy Spirit kind of on a continual basis. We focus a lot on the manifest presence of God in our midst. We all want to feel the presence of God, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and at times, when there's an outpouring of the Spirit, you will actually feel, <laughs> and I use these terms very carefully, feel the presence of the Lord. You'll feel, you know, just that presence that can be overwhelming. You'll feel the effects of the presence, which can lead you to tears or to joy or to expressions uh, of praise and of worship. Um, and then you'll also... Uh, have, uh, you know, just in his presence, a sense of, in, 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 like I said, I, I don't like to talk about these particular things like because people then start to try to run after them. And, and, and you, you'll feel like even a heat, you know, that comes from the presence of the Lord when he manifests himself. It's like a, it's like a glow, really. And, and uh, the first time, second time, you, you know, maybe you've, you've felt, you kind of wonder, what is that, you know? And, and, and it is the Holy Spirit. It's, it's what he does. But we tend to make, I think, too much of that. Um, and sometimes really depend on that too much to the exclusion of his constant presence with us. So what the Holy Spirit is doing in us each and every day of our lives, not just the wham-bam, you know, big 
deal things that he does. The outpourings where everybody's in the, in the place is weeping. And we, you know, like I say, we have this tendency to, to seek that and to want it. Not that there's anything wrong with seeking or wanting an outpouring or revival. Sometimes we use the term revival. We want to, and we think that, that that revival is an end in and of itself. In other words, getting to the revival, the outpouring is the end. And, and it's not. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is for refreshing so that you can come back to where you once were and start doing the things you once did, right? So if you get if you get revival and you get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but if you don't continue to abide in Christ, then all that was done in revival dies. So it's really maintaining a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. That, that is what we're after. Now, like I say, the manifestations, the, the times of refreshing as they're referred to in the book of Acts, the outpourings, the fresh fillings, these are all great. But really, we should be those that are, as Paul uses the phrase, we should be being filled with the Holy Spirit on a constant basis. It's, it's a phrase that he used, I think, I'm pretty sure it's in chapter 4. It's in the book of Ephesians for certain. No, actually, I think it's chapter 5. Let me just jump over there real quick. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I did want to kind of lay this, this idea out. Where he says... Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that little phrase where he says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's actually, a, in, in grammatical terms, it's called a present continuous. So be being filled. That's what it literally translates into in English. We would never say, hey, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't say that, but we don't have anything that expresses the Greek other than that. So it's kind of an odd expression, but the, the idea is be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we make such a big deal about being filled, you know, with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, like I say, I, I tend to say things that other people don't say, okay, so just hold on. I believe in some of the things that other people say. I just have a different take sometimes, you know. So it's not, it's not you don't have to wait for this, like, outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to come maybe once or twice in your lifetime. Paul tells us how to be being, being filled. How does he say to do it? Speak to yourselves. It's just that simple. When what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is the way to the Spirit-filled life. That is the way to live filled with the Holy Spirit. So that when you're singing, you know, uh, what? Spirit, touch your church, heal the hearts of men. Maybe that's a little bit more difficult. But, you know, just a simple, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. And you're going through your day. And you're hearing these songs. I don't know about you, but I'm constantly hearing songs coming up, rising up from my heart. And sometimes I don't even realize that the song's going. <laughs> but it's actually going. Have you ever experienced that? You kind of, oh, yeah, that's, oh, that's nice. Where'd that come from? <laughs> and, but it's going on on the inside of you. That's how you stay filled with the Holy Spirit on a constant basis. So what's happening is, out of your innermost being, these waters are welling up and they're welling over, right? That's why the song just breaks up. That's why the, it's the strangest thing when tragedy strikes and a Christian gets joyful. What is that all about? What? What, what, how, it's, it's paradoxical. It's something that happens that ought not to happen. It's like out of place. But in God's economy, it's not out of place. Why? Because James says that when you come into divers trials and temptations and difficulties, you should rejoice. Huh? You should rejoice in the man. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you come into those circumstances and those situations, there will be a breaking of your heart and it'll come up in, in a sense of joy. That's not to say that, that the grief disappears, but there is a presence and a joy with it, which is odd. 
I've told people for a long time, and I learned it most acutely, most sharply, when my daughter died, how that I could have the deepest of grief, and yet at the same time experience a deep sense of joy. Or this, and, and joy is very difficult to define, you know, what it is, but, but it's, it's like this, it's like this, confidence regarding your personal well-being. And it comes from the sense that God is with you. So you, regardless of what's going on, because you know that God is with you, it creates within you joy, which is quiet confidence in the midst of storms. It's a deep sense of calm, not the peace of God, but it's this deep sense of calm that kind of lets you chuckle at the adverse circumstances that you're going through. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> you know, whatever. And you've got this joy, and you've got a smile in the midst of difficulty and pain and sorrow and suffering. So you're going through it, but in, in the set, you're like shielded from it on the inside. Okay, so these are some of the things that the Holy Spirit, when you're in constant contact with him, you know, like on a daily basis, uh, occur on a regular basis in your life. And you don't have to wait, you know, to get to, to, get to the altar. <laughs> Nothing wrong with going to the altar. But man, you don't, have to, you don't have to wait, you know, a whole week. Oh, I can't wait to get to the altar. Why? Your altar is right in your heart. The Holy Spirit is right in your heart. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's there. All you got to do, if you want, is fall on your knees. I prefer to just lay on my bed. What do you mean? You lay on your bed and split and, and, and pray? Yes. Why? Because it's more comfortable. I don't know. I just do. But I spend my time and I pray there. And, and you know, there are... It, it, I could make a biblical case for, you know, I really can. Make a biblical case for just lying <laughs> in your bed and praying. <laughs> it's very personal in the Psalms. Uh, but anyway, so the point is, what we're going to try to do is get ourselves into a position where we are accessible to God, or where our hearts are accessible to him. Putting ourselves in a position that he can work on us and in us on a daily basis. Sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not aware of it. But that's faith. We know that wherever we are, he is. And wherever he is, he is active. Amen. He's always doing something in our hearts and in our lives. Even in those moments of, of where you're down and you're depressed or you've bummed or you've sinned or whatever, there's something that the Holy Spirit is ministering to you. There's something he's changing in you. There's something he's speaking to you. We just have to learn to be more sensitive to, to his voice. And when we learn about him, like we're going to do um, in this class, then it, it will give us grounds, huh? a reason to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and trust that He really is there and that He really does want to do something and that He really does want to help us and He really does want to fill us and overflow us regardless of the circumstances and situations that are there. So walking with the Holy Spirit, maybe that would be really good. Make, walking with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. You know, maybe I should name this this section of, of, the, of the course, something along those lines, walking with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Because that's what I'm trying to do. Get you in touch with God. Get you in touch with the Holy Spirit. Get you in touch with the one who's on the inside of you already. You don't have to go looking for the Holy Spirit. You know, when we had, when there's revivals that break out here, break out there, break out there, I, I have never gone. <laughs> I have never run around chasing revivals. I've always had a revival going on on the inside of me. Oh, but you might miss it. Yeah, I might miss that. But, you know, I might not miss anything. <laughs> it might just be that the Holy Spirit is working on the inside of me on a daily basis to such an extent that I'm always filled. And that, you know, can translate also into a church. A church should not be constantly chasing revival. A church should be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Constantly filled. Constantly filled. Yes. And, of course, thank God, God does revive Revive us, but revival is always 
How would you how do I say this? But be nice. It's always an indication that something's dead. <laughs> if you're seeking revival, it's because something's dead. It's not because something's alive. It's because the revival is just meant to bring you back into the presence of God and back into the place you're always supposed to be anyway. Again, bringing a balance. It's not to say we shouldn't have revival because as I look at the church worldwide, we do need revival. We do need a reviving amongst us. We do need a fresh visitation of the Holy Spirit. What I'm trying to say, on the other hand, is it's accessible. He's accessible to you every day, every mm -hmm. moment of every day. So that when you do feel weak and dry and, and out of sorts, you can go to him and he will bring that reviving to your heart on a daily basis. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So, we're going to uh, kind of lay this out, you know, step by step uh, tonight. And, um, you know, we'll throw little things in there as the Holy Spirit moves and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, we're really looking to build a case, to build uh, a teaching, to give you that confidence, you know, in the Holy Spirit and so on and so forth. So, who is the Holy Spirit? All right? That's, that's, that's a really good place to start. Who is the Holy Spirit? When we speak about... Who the Holy Spirit is we must first of all affirm that he is God. So he's God in every way that the Father is God. He's God in every way that the Son is God. The difference is in what they do within the Godhead, right? Each one of them has particular roles. So when we looked at the life of Jesus, we saw what he did. When we look at the Father, we saw what he did or what he does. When we look at the Spirit, we're going to see what he does as well. Now, our general, um, there, there, there are things that go way beyond us, right? So there are things that are particular to the Holy Spirit, particular to the Father, particular to the Son, within themselves, or within themselves. <laughs> kind of hard to speak about a trinity, right? With, within themselves, and the relationship that they have to one another, and so on and so forth. But most of what we're looking at is their relationship to us, right? Who is the Father to us? Who is the Son to us? Who is the Holy Spirit to us? And what are each one of them trying to effect uh, in our lives? So we're talking about function. And if we're talking about functions, it's always got to be in relationship to something. So we're talking about God in relationship to men. So if we take the case of, of salvation, does the Father have a role in salvation? Yes. What's the role of the Father in salvation? He sent the Son. Yeah, the Father sent the Son. What is the role of the Son in salvation? Redeemed. Right? He took on our sins and he died on the cross. That was his role. Father sent him and he sent him to redeem. And Jesus is the one who went to the cross, paid for our sins, and made available redemption to each and every one of us. What does the Holy Spirit do in redemption? Draws and convinces. Let's have some other people answer. <laughs> <laughs> he, he gives us understanding to what God is trying to teach us. Yeah, he does do that. That's part of it. He does draw us. That's part of it. He sanctifies us, right? If you want to get the, the, the big idea of what the Holy Spirit does, he sanctifies us. and what, That's a kind of a, a word that I think is unfamiliar with us, but basically... It, the basic idea is to draw us out of one thing and connect us to another. So the Holy Spirit works within the heart of a man. Now, now, what you have to understand is we're not talking about a saved man at this point. We're talking about men, sinners. The work of the Holy Spirit does not begin in, in our lives when we become Christians. We would actually never become Christians if the Spirit was not working in us, right? So the Holy Spirit is already working in us to make His presence known, to make the fact that God is real, real to us, and then He's drawing us unto Himself. Like, sorry about that. <laughs> Just received something. So He's drawing us to Himself, but He's also convicting us, right, of sin. 
He's showing us that we're out of sorts with God, and he's pointing us to Christ. He's testifying about Christ, and he does that to our heart. That's why when, you know, the, the, the unpardonable sin is to reject the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? It, it, is, it is to basically reject salvation because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is witnessing to you, whether you know it or not, he is witnessing in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus did come to do this, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's putting his stamp of approval on it in your heart, in a spiritual operation that goes on on the inside of you. Would you say he's... And then hopefully you'll be able to discern. Would you say he's... Uh, the, he gives you confirmation... Yeah, it gives you confirmation. You can, you can look at it from the term of, of confirmation. You can use that word. But the, the biblical term in English would be witness. Right? He bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God or that we're not. <laughs> right? So he brings a witness from God. Um, yeah, it's a witness. It's, it's as like you were, you were in a courtroom. Right? And somebody came in and sat on the stand... And the prosecutor began to grill them, began to ask them questions. And they came and witnessed to what they have seen or what they know. Right? That's what the Holy Spirit does in a spiritual operation in your heart. Mm -hmm. He does it through preaching. He does it through teaching. And so that when the Word of God is preached or taught, the Spirit of God witnesses to it. And that's what seals it. Mm -hmm. And when you reject that Spirit, then you bring to yourself condemnation. Because you have rejected the witness of the Holy Spirit. You've rejected the truth to which he has witnessed. <coughs> so we'll, we'll get in and we'll talk about a little bit more about that, uh, that particular part of it next week. What I want you to see is that he has a particular role in the different things that go on in, within his creation and within uh, the Godhead. They all have you know, an interpersonal relationship and how all that works. I Nobody really knows. But God knows. And that's enough. That's enough. Okay, so the Holy Spirit, I'm going to make a profound statement here. The Holy Spirit is holy. <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit is holy. <laughs> it, it, it may sound simple, but there are. You know, the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit that exists. Okay, God is the spirit. So the Father is the spirit, Jesus is the spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit. But did you know you are a spirit too? Yes. You and I are spiritual beings. We're not just made of clay. We're not just clay. There's something on the inside of us, right? We call it the heart. We call it the soul, right? But the New Testament, I believe that the case can truly be made that man is a three-tiered being, right? And the way I've heard it said is uh, man has a body, or, or man yes, is a spirit, lives in a body, and he has a soul. And that, to me, really does kind of, I think, give the fullest understanding of man's being, who man is. So if we want to talk about uh, and we will probably talk about you know the doctrine of man, humanity, who we are, what we are, why we were made, all that kind of stuff. But if you really look at our makeup, it's three different parts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very clear that uh, Paul, for example, talks about three sp specific different parts. I'm not going to get too far into it because I don't want to run off, but it just just give you to know some of these things. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or completely holy in the sense of holy, but holy completely. Um, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and, and there's other verses, you know, that talk about the spirit of man, that talk about the soulish realm of man, and that talk obviously about the body, I and mean, that's the one that, that we see. But there's a lot going on on the inside of you. I think that probably, for me, the best way to, to understand is what... Peter used the phrase, the, the hidden man of the heart, right? So the inner man is that hidden man. He's not visible to the eye, but he's 
within, and he's a spiritual being. Okay, so the, the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit around. We, too, are spiritual beings, right? 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 We have spiritual capabilities. We're able to perceive. We're able to comprehend. We're able to receive visions, etc., etc., when God gives it. But then there are also the, the angels, right? Uh, all the angels are spirits. And if you look in the Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, you'll see that they're not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. So all the angels, not just the good angels, <laughs> like Michael and Gabriel and, and the, the host of, of angelic beings, uh, the seraphim that are around the throne of God, the various classes, if you will, of angels or designations of angels that exist, but there's also the whole demonic force. So you have to realize that all the demons, all the, all the demonic uh, beings, spiritual beings, were once all angels of God, all servants of God. They all fell. They took sides with Luther. One third of them were swept away, right? Some of them are in change. Some of them are roaming the earth. Some of them are bringing temptation to us. Some of them are causing problems here, causing problems there. There's spirits of infirmity. There's spirits of lunacy. There's all different kinds of things, you know, that are going on that these spiritual beings are provoking. So there's all kinds of, of spiritual beings within the creation of God. And they're all created beings, right? Not just us, but all the angels are created beings. They weren't always. Only God is always. Mm -hmm. At some point, God created angels for some reason. <laughs> I, I can't see why he needed them, but he did, apparently. So, so we do have all these. However, you have no other spirit being that is referred to as the Holy Spirit. So there's a designation. Why would there be so much emphasis placed upon the quality of spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, right? It's, it's because God is trying to communicate to us the very essence of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He is holy. Mm -hmm. He is Awesome. Not in the sense, you know, kind of California girl, nothing against Pastor Mike's wife, Kristen. <laughs> you know, oh, isn't it awesome? It's so awesome. Everything is so awesome. Oh, it's so awesome. It's just awesome. Everything's awesome. No, no, not everything is awesome. And I won't get off on a rant about awesomeness and you know, different degrees of good things. You know, Some things are awesome. Some things are just okay. And there's nothing wrong with just okay. <clears throat> so, <laughs> one of the primary characteristics then of the Holy Spirit is that he is holy. Uh, the name communicates his essence. So all the names of God communicate something. Pastor Mike was talking about that on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. When God revealed himself to Moses by a name that he had never known, Yahweh. Yah, or whatever. Okay, you don't want to use the uh, the vowels and kind of whatever. So he communicates his essence, or if you will, his heart. And I love uh, one of the verses. It's always been uh, a, a comfort, uh, and at the same time a challenge. It's in First Peter uh, chapter chapter one, verse fifteen. But as he which hath called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of behavior, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And that's God's presentation to us of himself, and at the same time challenge to us to live our lives like he lives his life. And that's what Jesus is, is, has come to do, bring us back to a place where we can live our lives like he lives his. That's a high life, right? That's not the low life, that's the high life. That's the true life that he came yeah. to give us. The Apostle John, uh, that was Peter who, who, who was quoting actually from Leviticus in the Old Testament. The Apostle John, in the same manner, speaks of God's holy nature when he says this. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and we declare to you, God is light. Mm -hmm. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. No tendency towards evil. God cannot be tempted with evil. 
neither tempteth he every man. Can you imagine living in that, in that condition that you can't be tempted with evil? No, you can't. <clears throat> Why? Because we're tempted every day. If you're not tempted or haven't been tempted today, uh, you know, maybe you slept all day. I don't know. <laughs> but, the moment, but you can be tempted even in your dreams. People wake up with the craziest of dreams, doing the craziest of things. Why? Because just because you're sleeping doesn't mean you're turned off. Right? So Satan can get loose on the inside of your head if you open the door during the day. That's right. We find him, you know, doing that rat thing, you know, running through that rat race of your mind, creating all kinds of weird and ugly scenarios that, that are not nice. And so that's why we have him to become nightmares, things that are just horrible. Um, so you have you have a, an opening to that. Getting back to this, God is light, and in Him is no darkness. That really describes the holiness of God. He is light. There is no shadow of turning in him. He has absolutely no inclination to do evil, to do something that would be harmful to another being. There's no inclination in God to do that. None. It just doesn't exist. Isn't that an amazing thing? <laughs> that he has, he has absolute... We're not like that. <clears throat> there are times... And, and if you think back into the world, I was just telling somebody this yesterday, I forget. I can't remember who in the world I was talking to. It, it doesn't matter. When I was young, I had a, a baseball coach who publicly humiliated me. And I was probably 10 or 12 years old. 10 or 12 years old. He publicly humiliated me. And, and I just, I just did. I remember when I got older, 17, 18, I can remember thinking, if I run into this guy, he's had it. He's had it. And, and there weren't, weren't many people in my life, to be completely honest with you, that I wanted to do harm to. But this guy, that stuck in my heart for many years. And actually, even after I became a Christian, I had to deal with that because of the way that this guy just humiliated me in public. It was in front of my friends, you know, all this kind of... And, and I, could, I could remember thinking about taking a baseball bat to this guy, especially when I, was, when I was in the world. If I had seen him, I guarantee you I would have acted. I would have done something because it was, it was a flame, a burn that was on the inside of me. And all of us have had different times, and, you know, that would be vengeance, right? And vengeance sometimes turns into a flame. There's, there's jealousy or envy that operates in us and causes us to do this thing or that thing or to hold this particular attitude about this particular person. There's pride that rises in our heart and makes us want to strike out at others or say things about them and all these garbagey things. Even though we're new creatures in Christ Jesus and the Spirit is in us, we still have to deal with what the flesh. The Holy Spirit doesn't. <laughs> Jesus doesn't. He's got no inclination to do ill. And not only is it not an inclination to not do evil, it is a desire to always seek the well-being of others. It's a desire to always love others. That's walking in the light, right? That's following God. So he said, be holy. I'm holy, he said. That's me. That's my nature. I've got no inclination to evil. My, my heart is set on good towards all that I've created. See, there's two ways to look at it, right? Not to do something, but not, not, not to be neutral, right? I'm just not going to live my life. And that's where you get into what, what is, re, what is uh, uh, referred to in Christian circles or religious circles as legalism, right? I'm always just going to avoid doing evil, but I never put my hand to do good. No, it's a removal or a rejection of evil and a practice of resisting evil constantly. That's why Christians get tired, by the way. Because we're constantly resisting something. If you're not constantly resisting something, it's because you're overtaken. <laughs> Good point. Mm -hmm. So just get used to it. That's the arena that we're in. We're in an arena of a true fighter. 
we have to constantly be on the outlook for the enemy operating. I don't want you to look for a demon behind every, every bush, but I can guarantee you there's a lot of them out there. And there's enough in your flesh to keep you crucifying that flesh on a daily, minute-to-minute -minute basis. Because it's so easy for the flesh to get ignited. And when I'm talking about the flesh, I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily, um, you know, sometimes we have a thing of only looking at these things from some, some sort of a sexual point of view. That's just one part of it. It's a, it's a, it's a real part, but it's just one part. Mo most of us have more problems, and we don't deal with it, with things like envy and jealousy and anger and frustration and all of these different kinds of things that lead to all kinds of bad outcomes. Most of us have absolutely no idea how to control our tongue. The Bible talks about the tongue a lot. Yeah. A lot. And how to put a clamp on that baby. Why? Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is speaking. Right? So learning how to dominate the heart <laughs> right, and fill it with good things so that the outflow, the natural outflow of the heart is something worthwhile and useful. It's a lifetime of work in the hands of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, with that influence, we call it grace, right? Grace is the divine influence upon the heart. I love that definition of grace. The divine influence upon the heart. So if the Holy Spirit is the one who has influenced our hearts, what's he going to, what's he going to influence us towards? Holiness. And holiness is a resistance of evil and a giving of oneself to that which is good. No darkness, pure light, shining. Yes, ma'am. Can you uh, repeat that? No, I probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> what part? Uh, the grace. Grace. Oh, grace so is the divine influence. The divine. Very good. See, this is why my wife is so diligent to capture these things on tape, because they come out of me, and I really sometimes just forget them right after I said it. <laughs> That's why I write things down. Okay, so, not only is the Holy Spirit pure as light, and I love this, he is totally separate from the corruption that has affected all created things. He can't be corrupted. He's not a politician. Or a pastor. <laughs> Two of the things that are most loathsome in the world, I'll do a proverb for you, is a is a politician, right, who lies constantly, and a pastor who falls into sin. Mm -hmm. Those are two things the world cannot support, right? Or a judge that judges in, in unjustly, right? That meets out injustice instead of justice. The world can't survive <coughs> with those kinds of foundations, right? So you see that the Holy Spirit, although he is here in the world, permeates the world, he's not affected by the world. You know, John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, are all of the world and not of the Father. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you ought not to set your heart upon those things. He that loveth the, the world cannot love the Father. Right? So you see the Holy Spirit, he is here, he's permeating the world, but he cannot be permeated by the world. He can't be corrupted. It's that pure light. It's that water that just cannot take on contaminants. You know, we're, we're a muddy stream. You know, we flow for a little while, and, you know, after a certain bend, somebody dumps, you know, some chemicals into our, into our river of life, and we get contaminated. What is to be contaminated? There are elements that, that bring harm into the flow of our life, right? That's contamination. That's unholiness. When elements from outside of us enter into that flow, that stream of our life, so that our water no longer becomes safe and good water, it becomes a danger to people. Why? Because of thing. Let me give you an example on that. I, I, I say this with uh, you know, some pain in my heart. A friend of mine, a friend of ours, uh, actually a guy that I had worked with, discipled him uh, many, many years ago in Guatemala. Um, uh, wonderful young man, 
I know he's about 20, I was 27, 28, he worked, you know, the ministry I was working at, and he was under me. And uh, the Lord used him in, in, in a lot of, lot of different ways, and uh, over the last several years, or the last 10 years, he's been pastoring a church uh, in Guatemala. The church is huge, and there's at least 3,000 people that go just to the main hub, and then they've got 20 or 25 outshoot churches. And he was over all of these churches. And I seen him, you know, and we talked to him, and he was a good friend, Eric. I won't go any further than that. Eric, during those 10 years, and nobody knew it, it came out about two years ago, he was carrying on an adulterous relationship. While he was being used by God with all of these different things. I mean, When it came out and it was aired, <clears throat> okay, he he didn't he didn't remove himself and seek restoration. He split the church where he was. So the half of the people went with him and they started another church down the road. And the other church, you know, I don't know what happened to it. And the building is still there, but I'm half of the people aren't. <laughs> so I don't know what happened. But I got to thinking, and and this really brought sadness to my to my life. What is his soul like? What's his soul like? How many lies did he tell? Mm -hmm. How many lies did he tell to others? How many lies did he tell to himself to cover what he was doing for 10 years? 10 years. Concealing that. How many times did the Holy Spirit come to him and try to draw him and tried to bring him to a place, and he resisted. And what did all of that do to his soul? If you think that spending a period of time like that, you're just going to all of a sudden be cured because of some little confession of sin? Okay, I got caught. I did it. Forgive me, everybody. Let's move on. No. There has to come a complete rewiring of your head and of your heart. You've taken on the place of a liar. You've lived in a lie. You've lived covering yourself. You've lied to and hurt how many people? And just getting to a place of living your life that way requires a complete renovation. Is he lost? Yes. Does he have to stay lost? Absolutely not. The divine influence upon the heart can rewire everything that Satan had done. What did Jesus come to do? John said that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. So the works that the enemy did in him can be reversed. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity. You're never without hope. As long as you've got breath in your nostrils and a little hope in your heart and some humility before God, the Holy Spirit can remake and reestablish and Relift you up. I love the, pr the prayer of David after he got caught in sin. What did he say? Create in me what? A clean heart. Because he knew, he knew that the pathways of his mind had gone astray. He knew he wasn't thinking right. He knew he was covering up. He knew that he was allowing these things. And he was just trying to go on like nothing ever happened. And the Holy Spirit saying, no, 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 no. Not so easy. You might get away with that with, with people who are under your control and under your command, but not me. I'm God, not you. And if you want to walk with me, these things have to get straightened out. And that's why he prayed that prayer. He prayed that prayer, create me a clean heart, renew a right spirit or a faithful spirit in me. And then he says, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, take not that divine influence from my life. Take not that fellowship from my life. Restore these things to my life. So they can be restored. But the point that I'm making is, is that we can be corrupted. The Holy Spirit cannot. Mm -hmm. He is an ever flowing pure stream into our hearts and into our lives. So when you get some corruption into your life, what does the Holy Spirit do? Mm -hmm. He floods you with more water. Mm -hmm. And what does that water do? It diminishes the contaminants until they're gone. 
right? That's what fresh water does. Mm -hmm. It takes out the impure things and leaves you, who were once contaminated, fresh and clean and new before him. So these are some of the things that the Holy Spirit is all about doing. He's pure light in that he seeks the well-being of all his creation and he has no inclination to do evil. I mentioned that to you. He's separated from corruption in that he cannot be corrupted to do anything contrary to holy perfection. James 1.17, there's no shadow of turning. He, he, he doesn't get up one day and think this and get up the next day. Eh, he doesn't really get up. But you know what I'm saying. I'm trying to use an analogy that we understand. He doesn't go from one point to another point and change. He doesn't change. He's always the same. Why can he always be the same? Because he's perfect. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever change? I hope so. Yes. We change from second to second sometimes. Sometimes our emotions change so fast. At 8.59 and 42 seconds, we're positive, uplifted, and strengthened. At 8.59. At 8.60 or at 9 o'clock, 20 <laughs> seconds later, we're all bummed out and depressed. Mm -hmm. It can happen like a flash. Just something come in and boom. <laughs> 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 and sometimes we're as fickle as that regarding the outworkings of our lives, the things that we allow and the things that we don't allow. We can be in the presence of God and then just go and trash ourselves with something trashy. How do we do that? <laughs> There's something inconsistent about us, right? There's none of that in God. There's none of that in the Holy Spirit who is on the inside of you. And yes, he does go when we do stuff like that. When you see your kids doing something stupid. Right? He does the same thing. It's called grieving the Holy Spirit. He can get grieved. By our actions. Why? Because he doesn't change. He's that light. He's that holiness. He's that purity. And he's constantly expressing and exuding that force in your life. Don't get discouraged. <laughs> right? Isn't that what, what the, the writer of Hebrews said? God corrects those he loves. But his hand is there and it's hot and it's heavy and it's constant. Constant. But we need it. We need that divine influence. Thank God for his gentleness. Thank God for his uh, mercy. Amen. So not only can he not be tempted, he constantly exercises his holy influence by creation, corrupted by man's sin, to bring them and all possible created things back to the original state of purity. The work began on the cross for man's salvation will end with the renovation of the earth by fire. Do you know fire is going to fall? Not just in California. <laughs> the whole earth, the whole globe is going to be burned up. All the elements. It's all going to fry. Huh? It started in California. <laughs> it may. <laughs> California does obviously get their share of, of wildfires and you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, if it is God, uh, to be completely honest with you. Um, he knows what he, what he does. We don't always know these kinds of things. And we can't necessarily put the hand of God on all these different activities that are going on. There are different reasons for different things. But that's not to say that God does not judge. He does judge. He does do things. He hasn't stopped being the God of the Old Testament. He raises up one nation against another and does these things and does those things. He's still that God. And he is still active in, in the political sphere. It's just because man thinks that we're in charge. It doesn't mean God thinks that, it, that we are. Right? God has a plan and a purpose, and he's moving all of history towards the fulfillment of that plan and purpose. And whatever those things are that are, are him and whatever things are that are simply natural occurrences, or unnatural occurrences, if you will, um, you know that's that's known only and completely by by God Himself. Yeah. I do have notes for you guys, by the way. So, very important aspect: uh, the Holy Spirit, beyond being holy, is not 
And, and I think we look at him too often this way as being a presence or a force. It's not the force to be with you. That's, that's not the Holy Spirit. He is a force. Make no mistake about that. You know, but we reduce him to a presence <coughs> or a force. And we want your presence. But what are we saying when we want your presence? What are we saying when we need the power of God? Right? Is, is he just power? Is he just a presence? No. He's a person. Just like the Father is a person and the Son is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. One of the great ways that you can know that he is a person is he communicates. Does he or does he not? He can what? Communicates. Yes. Do not all personal beings communicate? Mm -hmm. Don't you communicate? I think women use like how many words? 22,700 a day. And, and men use about 5,000. That's more or less, I think, the ratio. Yeah. Well, Jake, you may be an exception to that rule. I, mean, sort of, <laughs> I don't know. I just don't know if I believe that or not because I never heard of that. Yeah, women use a lot more words than men do. But anyway, I wonder why. So he's a person, a person of the divine trinity, because he is a person. He communicates. He communicates with us on a constant basis about everything that is of importance to our lives in the interests of the kingdom of God. He's always talking. He's all, sometimes it's not talking like, you know, you don't hear him necessarily often like I'm talking to you. But there are all kinds of ways that he communicates. Mm -hmm. He communicates by the witness, right? You have a sense on the inside of you. Some people would call it intuition. And in the world, a person that is separate from God, intuition could just be that natural perception of things. I just had a feeling. And it, and it, and it came true, right? But there's also the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You have a something on the inside. Words weren't communicated. The Holy Spirit didn't say, get up now, Harold, and go. You just knew that it was time to get up and go. You just knew that it was time to make this change. You knew. How do you explain that knowing? You can't. But it came to you through the power of convincing. The Holy Spirit persuades us to do this or to not do that. He is extremely active in the area of our conscience. What is conscience? Conscience is that wonderful and sometimes annoying <laughs> little voice on the inside of your head that's telling you, that, 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 don't do that. And as a born-again person, the Holy Spirit is in direct communication with your conscience and impressing upon your conscience his way of living, his way of being. In the world, your conscience was diminished. In the world, your conscience was hardened. We can do the same thing when we're Christians because we constantly resist God. When you constantly tell God, no, 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 you will harden your heart so that you become insensitive to him. Right? You're, what you're trying to do is callous your heart. What, what does a callous do? A callous is something that forms because of constant rubbing against something, right? Mm -hmm. In you know, your feet or your hands and you're working on stuff and constant rubbing. And the callous will develop it. It becomes hard so that it is no longer sensitive to the movement, the action, the pricking, the thing that goes on. But the Holy Spirit wants to be a constant almost said a funny thing, a constant <laughs> pricking, I'll say it that way, a constant pricking in your heart and in your life. But if you use the word prick, it, it, it really does mean that. So if you say that somebody is a, quote, prick, you're saying that they are somebody who goads you, somebody who irritates you, somebody who gets under your skin. Right? We've all had people like that in our lives, haven't we? Mm. Well... There's no one like the Holy Spirit to goad you and to prick you and to do all of these things. Why? To try to keep you alive, to try to keep you holy, to try to keep you in a way that God can draw near to you and not go, Aki. <laughs> oh, I love you, my child, but you're just so lucky. <laughs> I hate, I hate. Yeah, like a kid that falls in a horse pile, you know. 
Oh, gee, dear, I love you. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> Go clean up first. Right? He wants to keep you away from the horse. He wants to keep you on the right path so that the communication is constantly clean, constantly flowing, and that your heart is, is not hardened. You know how easy it is for us to harden our hearts? Mm -hmm. It's very easy. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. You know, he won't make you do anything. Mm -hmm. Jesus never said, oh, please come follow me. He just said, follow me. Oh, you don't want to? Okay, you leave him too. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh, that's a hard saying. Who can hear it? Oh, did you hear what they said? Yeah, you leave him too. He never changed his standard. He never changed who he was. He ought not. Thank God he didn't. Thank, thank you, Lord. <laughs> right? Because it would bring everything down. It would dumb everything down. It's kind of like the curve on a test, right? Mm -hmm. When you use curves on tests, nobody really got more than a 72. But when you apply the curve, you know, the first thing got a 72 is now at a 94. <laughs> and everybody else was brought up to passing, even though they got, really got a 46. <laughs> right? Oh, well, well, God doesn't care. He doesn't have this curve for us. He is the standard. The Holy Spirit administers that standard. And that's why it sometimes is uncomfortable to be in the presence of the Holy God. It really, when he really manifests himself, <laughs> it can get real uncomfortable. <laughs> real uncomfortable. And, but that's a good thing. Yeah, and really, it's a good thing. When you can accept it and you receive it and you know walk on it. So that kind of leads us over to... <laughs> The time is like, I probably got to finish up here or something. Sorry. Got to get moving. Uh, probably finish with a couple of comments on this. This is, it's come to be one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Uh, Psalm 139. And I think what I'm going to do is just uh, read it and. Uh, just make a, a few comments that, you know, as we go through it. This, maybe this would be the last thing uh, that I touch on and pick up some of the other things next week. Psalm 139. Uh, let's, let's just read one bit and, and we'll see what we go from there. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You see what I'm talking about, conscience? You see I'm talking about the divine presence constantly. You've searched me. Can you imagine that? There is somebody searching you, even right now. <laughs> you can't run, you can't hide, you can't find a place to be alone. Oh, no, no. He's on the inside. <laughs> I love it. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. A lot of people start trembling right there. Oh, Lord, he knows me? You mean he knows me intimately? You mean he knows all the things that I hide from all the dumb people around me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've always wondered why people try to hide things from the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like he knows, you know. <laughs> he knows already. You, want, you know, if you're a rebel, just tell him, God, I'm a rebel. It's a whole lot better off. I mean, oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and know me. Thou knowest my down-sitting... And my uprising. So he knows me when I'm sitting down. He knows me when I'm getting up. He knows me when I'm where? In bed. See? And he knows me when I'm getting up, running around, doing all my stuff in life. He knows me. You, you understand my thought afar off. In other words, before it happens. You compass my path. And, here we go again, my lying down. I told you. <laughs> you compass my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. And it's not just a, a, a general acquaintance. When he's saying you're, he's acquainted, it's saying he has full knowledge of all your ways. You don't even know you like he knows you. And that's a scary thing. Why? Because he has a complete objective view of you. A view of you as you truly are. Because you and I don't see ourselves as we really are. We see ourselves through our own eyes. It's called subjectivism. Right? We see ourselves as we want to see ourselves. 
So we dumb down the things that aren't so nice. And we focus on the things that are better. I'm better than that person. You would never say that. Well, some of you might. <laughs> right? But we're saying it all the time. I'm better than so-and-so. Oh, look what they did. Look what I know. I would never do that. Well, you may never do that, but you would do some other nasty thing. So at the core, we're all the same. We're all wall breakers. Right? For there is not a... I love this. There is not a word in my mouth, in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord... You know it all together. What does that mean? That means, okay, so the word that came out of your mouth proceeded from your heart. And it was the result of thinking. It was the result of pondering, of meditation, of how you view this person, or how you view that person, or how you understand this situation. God saw you formulating that thought within your heart, and before it came out of your mouth, he knew what was coming out. Because he knows you better than you know yourself. Not only that, he knew what you would say today from eternity. So before you were born, before you were formed, he knew the day was going to come when that was going to come out of your mouth. Now that can scare you or it can be a great comfort. Because you can say, God already knew my worst moment and still loves me. Amen. Still loves me. That's right. Yes. So that his love and mercy surpass this deep, intimate knowledge that he has on us. It's an incredible thing. This is good. I hope you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Thou hast beset me behind and before. In other words, you've taken up a flank before me and behind me. You're before, you're behind. There's no escape. And you've laid your hand... Oh, this is the most difficult. I've meditated on this in lots of... You've laid your hand upon me. It doesn't get any closer. That's touch, right? You've laid your hand upon me. When somebody touches you, you know, when somebody touches you, that's a very intimate thing. Especially in our day today, right? <laughs> Where we're, you know, the most innocuous touching can be construed as a pass or an offense or whatever. The point is, is that touching is an intimate thing. You have to be careful, not only in, in our day, but even in days gone by. You touch certain people in certain ways, and you don't touch certain people in certain ways, right? But here we have the Holy Spirit with his perfect touch laying his hand upon us. Ah! That's kind of scary, isn't it, Harold? You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He doesn't mean wonderful in the sense of, wow, awesome. He means wonderful in the sense of, it's too big, it's too much. What you know about me is beyond what I know about myself. I, I can't comprehend all that you comprehend about me. It's high. I can't attain to it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Where, how can I get out of here? Get that hand off of me. Get out of my heart. I need freedom. After all. all right? This is what David's saying. Oh, I'm weary with your presence. I'm weary with you constantly needling, constantly digging, constantly showing me these things. <laughs> Don't be disheartened. I'm going to correct you. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Whither shall I speak from your prayer? And if I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell. There we go, making beds again. Make my bed in hell. Behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the other parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I were to say, surely the darkness will cover me. I can't wait for nighttime. That's when people go out, right? Two o'clock in the morning. That's when they do all their little nasties, right? Because they think it's under the cover of darkness. There is a, it's a physical thing, but it has an impression upon the heart. Mm -hmm. That this darkness is somehow going to shield me. Mm -hmm. This is when most crimes are committed, right? Mm -hmm. In the dark. Mm -hmm. People don't do, oh my gosh, they did that in broad daylight. Did you hear about the, the family that was killed, Mormon family that was killed in Mexico? Mm -hmm. yeah. They just eliminated them. Nine, nine, nine people, three adults and uh, six mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. Two of them were eight-year-old twins. Eight-month-old mm -hmm. twins. 
And they said they did this in broad daylight. Why did they say they did this in broad daylight? Why does that emphasize something that's bold? Why? Because most people do dirty deeds in the darkness. Right? So this is what he's saying here. You see how I love how applicable the Bible is. And how it just gets you know, to the core of everything. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, even the night shall be light about me. So even in the darkest place where I think I'm hidden and nobody has any clue about the nasty things that I'm doing, you're still there. You're still there. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. There's no hiding. Let this script, let this passage just sink into your ear. It'll change your relationship with the Holy Spirit. It'll change your relationship with God when you know who the Holy Spirit is and that you can't hide anything from Him. He's there and present in your life to do you good. To do you good. For thou possessed my reins, right? My inner being. You possess them. You encompass them. Actually, I had a... Let me see. I, I rewrote this. Well, let me, let me read it from the scripture. It says, You possessed my reins, and you covered me in my mother's womb. Right? I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. This is the way I kind of translated it. You encircled my inner being and watched over me while you formed me in the womb. You encircled my inner, my heart, huh? the spiritual part of me. That spiritual part of me was there when I was conceived. And all the physical parts were there, all growing, all maturing, right? Until it got to the place where, where, we, could be, where we could be born. But God was there. He formed your inner being. He encircled it. I think that's amazing. My substance, right? So my in the fetal time, or even before it got to a grown fetus, my substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret in my mother's belly, right? And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, my mother's womb, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. Now what does that mean? Your eyes saw me when I was still at the molecular stage. Where I was just a, you know, I hate the way these abortionists say it, just a bag of cells. But God saw a person. Amen. Not only the inner being, but the formation of the very physical life, the biological life, that was that was mature in that room. Your eyes to see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which is continuance, which in continuance were fashioned. So as I continued to grow, they began, they began to take form and they began to take shape. So right from the cellular, all the way from the molecular to the cellular, and then to the, the formation of all of that stuff into a human being, God was there. So how could he not know you if he knew you from before conception? <laughs> Even at the point of conception, he knew you. That's what David's trying to say here. What well, is all this? Right there, I was there. Of course he knows you. You did. How many of you remember being in the room? <laughs> <laughs> None of us do. Most of us probably don't have memories even earlier than five years old. Well, Jake might be because he's closer to that age. <laughs> but nobody, nobody remembers that stuff. I don't remember. I maybe, you know, remember some things. My dad died when I was two and a half. And I can remember one time thinking, yeah, you know, I think I'm pretty sure that this, I remember this happening. So I went to my mom and I said, hey, mom, you know, I was thinking about this. Did this happen? She said, no, I don't ever remember that. <laughs> it was just something I made up in my own head because I was desperate for a memory of my father. I never had one, two and a half years old. So you don't remember those things, but you know what? God was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he does remember. 
He knows how your cells came together. Your particular cells. Not just how cells in general come together. Your particular cells. He could tell you how it happened. You couldn't understand it, I couldn't understand it, but he could tell you. That's how intimate he is with you. That's the one living inside you. He knows your inner parts. How precious also are thy thoughts to me. You see, you go from the stage of, of fearfulness of this God to factoring in the fact that he is good and holy and pure and he's on your side and he wants the best and it actually becomes inviting. You're actually thankful that he's there to keep you on the right path. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the hairs of my of the, no, not the hairs of my head. The head, the number that the sand. When I awake, you see, there we go with God sleeping again. When I awake, I am still with you. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am I not? A, a, I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And then he ends with this. Search me, O God. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me. Test me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. That presupposes, of course, that God is good, right? Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me down the path that leads to everlasting life. It presupposes that God is good, that the Holy Spirit is good, that the divine influence is good, that the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and knowing you, every inch of you, every centimeter of you, every of you. I think that capturing it is that he knows the words that are going to come out of your mouth before you say it. Sometimes, you know, our spouses can finish our sentences. That's only because of repetition, right? They've heard you say it before. They know, what, they know what's coming next. So they know you to that, that extent. But God knows every word that comes out of your mouth, and he knows why. He knows from where it's coming. He knows the influences that are being exerted upon that word, whether they're fleshly, like pride, arrogance, um, uh, envy or jealousy, any of those nasty things, or if those things coming out of your mouth are provoked by true love. Because a lot of us say things, you know, <laughs> that it's just a mask for the nastiness that's actually in the heart. Hmm. Right? People that speak with a double tongue. Right? They say one thing, but their heart's not with you. Right? They compliment you, but you know it's not genuine. There's just something that you don't think nah, that wasn't genuine. Yep, I love that look where he just gave him. And it, it is like that, you know. Who wants that? I don't want that. That's what the look I'm giving you? No, not the look you're giving me. That yep. thing where people say say something to you, but in their heart it, they don't mean it. They don't mean it. Look, I'm not giving you that look. I'm no, I said Ray. <laughs> Ray. But, but he wasn't giving me that look. He was just expressing what that feels like when you know yeah. somebody is acting that way. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is at work and active in our hearts, bringing us to a place where the very words that come out of our mouth are sincere and true and full of life. You can't do that by yourself. Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> None of us can. Well, inept, incapable, powerless to live that life of true integrity so that from the heart we speak good things. You know how, how hard that is? To speak good things from the heart? <laughs> you can say a lot of good things like I've said. But a lot of it isn't coming from the heart. A lot of it is just a facade you're putting on. You just want other people to think well of you. That's not coming from the heart. 
without Jesus, without the Spirit, without the Father working, that divine influence, that power within us, just playing a part. You know, the, the, the original, the word hypocrite, and it's a Greek word, right? And originally, it was an actor. That's, that's what a hypocrite is, it's an actor. They, they physically put on a mask to play the role of somebody else. And they would feed through that mask that person. Mm -hmm. And that's what people do in life. They feed the rest of us what they want us to see, the person that they're portraying in their heart. But to hear, to see, and to know what's really on the inside, and to be completely honest with you, we probably don't want to really open up and share with everybody everything that's in our heart. That's just a little ray of wisdom I want to give to you. I don't want you going out here and just speaking the unadulterated truth to everybody else. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's not, not what I'm trying to get you to do. There are things you need to just keep between you and Jesus. Right? You know what I'm saying? You don't need to be telling you. Back in the 60s, they were on this weird, crazy, you got to tell the truth all the time. It's, it's, it's not, we're not talking about lying. We're talking about knowing what to share and what not to share. Right? You don't just go out and tell people everything. People can't handle it. They can't handle it. <clears throat> anyway. I think God does that to us. He doesn't tell us a lot of stuff. No, we, yeah. we would OD. Yeah. <laughs> we would OD on divinity. <laughs> he uses that quality. Yeah, yeah. That's not lying. No, no. He can't share. He's you know, waiting for the he, right time. Well, yeah, even yeah. Jesus, you know, he talked about it. He said, I, I have many things to say to you, but you're not, you're not capable. Not you're not right able yet. to hear what I, I want to communicate Amen to you at yeah. this point. So there has to be growth. There has to be, and even in your relationship with people in your family, you, you don't just... You know, you don't share your temptations with your wife, right? You keep those to yourself and be, between you and God, or maybe a, a person, a, a, another person you that you are accountable to. Some people like to do that. Be accountable with, to another person. Hey, you know, I've been having struggles with this. and this. But, you know, you got to be, you don't talk about things like that with your 12-year-old daughter or your 12-year-old son. Or you, know, you know what I'm saying? A little bit of wisdom. It's not lying, it's choosing the right person to express the right thing at the right time. Okay. Anyway, the Holy Spirit's communications with us are absolutely perfect. Whatever he says, he says perfectly at the right time, the right place, for the right reasons. We have a very difficult time doing that. We may say the right thing, but at the wrong time. <laughs> to the wrong person. <laughs> Do we, do, we, do we not do that constantly? We do. That's where we get into trouble. Anyway. This is the Holy Spirit uh, to a very small extent. Uh, this, oh, what time is it? Oh, 820, I got to stop. Okay, so I'm going to give you uh, your handouts, and it's, it's got a section on it. Now, I might go through some of the things uh, next week, but the symbols that illustrate the Holy Spirit, right? Different symbols that the Bible uses. Um, water is one, uh, wind is another, oil, fire. Uh, these are different things that describe the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in our particular lives. Uh, so you have those in your notes. And like I said, I might touch on some of those uh, to start next week, but I'm going to move a little bit further beyond that. I'm going to look into some statements that Jesus made in chapters 14 through 16 of the book of John regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. So if you wanted to read those three chapters, uh, as a precursor to get ready for some of the things that we're going to be looking at, you, you can do that. Um, and you get a, a better feel. So like I said, we're trying to get a broad view of what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts on a daily basis to keep the fire glowing on the inside of us. And that constant presence and that constant knowing of us and constant communication to us of his knowledge of us is a thing that will keep the fire glow you know, burning on the inside of us. He's going to keep you. He's going to preserve you. You understand? He's going to keep you. He's going to preserve you. He has that power. He will do it. You may be on a slide right now, but he can lift you from wherever you're at 
Amen. Right? He's with you. Amen. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for just this brief introduction to the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I, for me it's been good. So I trust that it's been good for your people, Lord. And learning, Lord, a little bit about who you are and about the depth, Lord, of your knowledge of us and of the wonderfulness of your communications to us because you're a person, Holy Spirit. And you love us and you respond to us and you teach us and you instruct us and you guide us and you rebuke us when we need it and you encourage us, Lord, God, in our moments of difficulty. And Lord, you even coach us along, Heavenly Father, uh, down life's path. So just so very thankful today for your presence and for opening up to us this night who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.